The Giver by Lois Lowry. Day 2. He turned toward Lily and noticed, to his satisfaction, that her ribbons were, as usual, undone and dangling. There would be an announcement like that quite soon, he felt certain, and it would be directed mainly at Lily, though her name, of course, would not be mentioned. Everyone would know. Everyone had known, he remembered, with his humiliation, that, that the announcement, attention, this is a reminder to male elevens that objects are not to be removed from the recreation area, that snacks are to be eaten, not hoarded, had been specifically directed at him the last, excuse me, the day last month that he had taken his active apple home. No one had mentioned it, not even his parents, because the public announcement had been sufficient to produce the appropriate remorse. He had, of course, disposed of the apple and made his apology to the recreation director the next morning before school. Jonas thought again about that incident. He was still bewildered by it, not by the announcement on the necessary apology. Those were standard procedures. He had, he had deserved them, but by the in, in incident itself, he probably should have brought him up with. He probably should have brought up his feeling of bewilderment that very evening when the family unit had shared their feelings of the day. But he had not been able to sort out and put words to the source of his confusion, so he had let it pass. It had happened during the recreation period when he had picked when he had been playing with Asher. Jonas had, ca had casually picked up an apple from the basket where the snacks were kept and had thrown it to his friend. Asher had thrown it back. They had begun a simple game of catch. There had been nothing special about it. It was an activity that he had performed countless times. Throw, catch, throw, catch. It was effortless for Jonas and even boring, though Asher enjoyed it. Playing catch was a required activity for Asher because it would improve his hand-eye coordination, which was not up to standards. But suddenly Jonas had noticed, following the path of the apple through the air with his eyes, that a piece of fruit had, well, this was the part that he couldn't adequately understand, the apple had changed, just for an instant. It had changed in mid-air, he remembered. Then it was in his hand, and he looked at it carefully, but it was the same apple, unchanged. The same size and shape, a perfect sphere. The same nondescript shade, about the same shade as his own tunic. There was absolutely nothing remarkable about that, about that apple. He had tossed it back and forth between his hands a few times, then thrown it again to Asher, and again, in the air, for an instant only, it had changed. It had happened four times. Jonas had blinked, looked around, and had tested his eyesight, squinting at the small print on the identification badge and attached to his tunic. He read his name quite clearly. He could also clearly see Asher at the other end of the throwing area, and he had had no problem catching the apple. Jonas had been completely Ash, he had called. Does anything seem strange to you about the apple? Yes, Asher called back, laughing. It jumps out of my hand onto the ground. Asher had just dropped it once again. So Jonas laughed too, and with his, with his laughter, tried to ignore his uneasy conviction that something had happened. When he had taken the apple home against the recreation area, area rules that evening, before his parents and Lily arrived at the dwelling, he had held it in his hand and looked at it carefully. It was slightly bruised now because Asher had dropped it several times, but there was nothing at all unusual about the apple. He had held a magnifying glass to it. He had tossed it several times across the room, watching, and then rolled it around and around on his desktop, waiting for the thing to happen again. But it had one thing that happened was the announcement later that evening over the speaker, the announcement that had singled him out without using his name, that had caused both of his parents to glance meaningfully at his desk where the apple still lay. Now, sitting at his desk, staring at his schoolwork as his family hovered over the new child in his basket, he shook his head, trying to forget the odd incident. He forced himself to arrange his papers and try to study a little before the evening meal. The new child, Gabriel, stirred and whimpered, and father spoke softly to Lily, explaining the feeding procedure as he opened the container and held the formula like equipment. The evening proceeded as all evenings did in the family unit, in the dwelling, in the community, quiet, reflective, time for renewal and, pre and preparation for the day to come. It was different only in the addition to, the, uh, to it of the new child with his pale, solemn, knowing eyes. Chapter 4 Jonas rode at a leisurely pace, glancing at the bike boards beside the buildings to see if he could spot Asher. He didn't often do this. Uh, he didn't often do his volunteer hours with his friend because Asher frequently fooled around and had made serious work a little difficult. But now, with 12 coming so soon and the volunteer hours ending, it didn't seem to matter. The freedom to choose where to spend those hours had always seemed a wonderful luxury to Jonas. Other hours of the day were so carefully regulated. He remembered when he had become an eighth, as Lily would do shortly, and had been faced with that freedom of choice. The eights always set out on their first volunteer hour a little nervously, giggling and staying in group of friends, 
construction to helping to spot Ash's bicycle parked beside one of the small factories where Bob was building. He passed the child care facility where Lily stayed after school and the play area surrounding it. He rode through the central plaza and the large auditorium where public meetings were held. Jonas slowed and looked at the name tags on the bicycles lined up outside the nurturing center. Then he checked those outside food distribution. It was always fun to help with the deliveries, and he hoped he would find his friends there so that they could go together on the daily rounds, carrying the cartons of supplies into the dwellings of the community. But he finally found Asha's bicycle, leaning as usual, instead of upright on its board, as it should have been at the house of the old. There was only one other child's bicycle there, and that of a female 11 named Fiona. Jonas liked Fiona. She, had a good, she was a good student, quite quiet and polite, but she had a sense of fun as well and didn't surprise him that she was working with Asher today. He parked his bicycle neatly in the board beside theirs and entered the building. Hello, Jonas, the attendant at the front desk said. She handed him a sign-up sheet and stamped her own official seal beside his signature. All of his volunteer hours would be carefully tabulated at the home of the open records. Once long ago, it was whispered among the children at 11 had arrived at the ceremony at 12 only to hear a public announcement that he had not completed the required number of volunteer hours and would not, therefore, be given his assignment. He had been permitted an additional month in which to complete the hours and then given his assignment privately with no applause, no celebration, a disgrace that had clouded his entire future. It's good to have some volunteers here today, the attendant told him. We celebrated a release this morning, and that always throws the schedule off a little. Some things get backed up. So, excuse me, she looked at a printed sheet. Let's see, Asher and Fiona are helping in the bathing room. Why don't you join them there? You know where that is, don't you? Jonas nodded, thanked her, and walked down the long hallway. He glanced into the, into the rooms on either side. The old were sitting quietly, some visiting and talking with one another, others doing handwork and simple crafts. A few were asleep. Each room was com comfortably furnished, the floors covered with a thick, a thick carpeting. It was a serene and slow-paced place, unlike the busy centers of manufacture and distribution where the daily work of the community occurred. Jonas was glad that he had, over the years, chosen to do his hours in a variety of places so, so that he could have, excuse me, so that he could experience the differences. He realized, though, that not focusing on one area meant he was left with not the slightest idea, not even a guess, of what his assignment would be. He laughed softly. Thinking about the ceremony again, Jonas, he teased himself, but he suspected that with the date so near, probably all of his friends were too. He passed a caretaker walking slowly with one of the old in the hall. Hello, Jonas, the young uniformed man said, smiling pleasantly. The woman beside him, whose arm he held, was hunched over as she shuffled along in her soft slippers. She looked toward Jonas and smiled, but her dark eyes were clouded and blank. He realized, he realized she was blind. He entered the bathing room with its warm, moist air and scent of cleansing lotions. He removed his tunic, hung it carefully on a wall hook, and put on the volunteer's smock that was folded on a shelf. Hi, Jonas! Asher called from the corner where he was kneeling beside a tub. Jonas saw Fiona nearby at a different tub. She looked up and smiled at him, but she was busy gently washing a man's leg in the warm water. Jonas greeted them and the caretaking attendants that worked nearby. Then he went to the row of padded lounging chairs where others of the old were waiting. He had worked here before. He knew what to do. Your turn, Larissa, he said, reading the name tag on the woman's robe. I'll, I'll just start the water and then help you up. He pressed the button on a nearby empty tub and watched as the warm water flowed in, th in through many small openings on the sides. The tub would be filled in a minute, and the, and the water flow would stop automatically. He helped the woman from the chair, led her to the tub, removed her robe, and steadied her with his hand on, on her arm. As, he, as she stepped in and lowered herself, she leaned back and sighed with pleasure. Her hand, excuse me, her head on a soft cushion headdress. Comfortable? He asked, and she nodded, her eyes closed. Jonas squeezed the cleansing lotion on, onto the clean sponge at the edge of the tub and began to wash her frail body. Last night he had watched as his father bathed the new child. This was much the same: the fragile skin, the soothing water, the gentle motion of his hand, the slippery with soap, the relaxed, peaceful smile on the woman's face reminded him of Gabriel being bathed and the nakedness, too. It was against the rule for children or adults to look at each other's nakedness, another's nakedness. But the rule did not apply to new children or the old. Jonas was glad. It was a nuisance to keep oneself covered while changing for games, and the required apology if one had, by mistake, glimpsed another's body was always awkward. He couldn't see why it was necessary. He 
liked the feeling of safety here in this warm and quiet room. He liked the expression of trust on the woman's face as she lay in the water unprotected, exposed, and free. From the corner of his eye, he could see his friend Fiona help the old man from the tub and tenderly pat his thin, naked body dry with an absorbent cloth. She helped him into his robe. Jonas thought Larissa had drifted into sleep as the old often did. He was careful to keep his motions steady and gentle so, she, so he wouldn't wake her. He was surprised when, when she spoke, her eyes still closed. This morning we celebrated the release of Roberto, she told him. He was watching. I knew Roberto, Jonas said. I helped with his feeding the last time I was here just a few weeks ago. He was a very interesting man. Larissa opened her eyes happily. They told his whole life before they released him, she said. They always do. But to be honest, she whispered with a mischievous look, some of the tellings are a little boring. I mean, I've even seen some of the old fall asleep during telling. When they released Edna recently, did you know Edna? Jonas shook his head. He couldn't recall anyone named Edna. Well, they tried to make her life sound meaningful, and of course, she added primly, all lives are meaningful. I don't mean that they aren't. But Edna, my goodness, she was a birth mother, and then she worked in film production for years until she came here. She never even had a family unit. Marissa lifted her head and looked around to make sure no one else was listening. Then she confided, I don't think Edna was very smart. Jonas laughed. He raised her left arm, laid it back into the water, and began to wash her feet. She murmured with pleasure as he massaged the feet with a sponge. But Roberto's life was wonderful, Marissa went on, after a moment. He had been an instructor of the Levins. You know how important that is. And he'd been on the planning committee. And, goodness, I don't know how he found the time. He also raised two very successful children. And he was also the one who did the landscaping design for the Central Plaza. He didn't do the actual labor, of course. Now you're back. Lean forward and I'll help you sit up. Jonas put his arm around her and supported her as she sat. He squeezed the sponge against her back and began to rub her sharp public shoulders. Tell me about the celebration. Well, there was the telling of his life. That is always first. Then the toast. We all raised our glasses and cheered. We chanted the anthem. He made a lovely goodbye speech. And several of us made little speeches, wishing him well. I didn't go. I've never been fond of public speaking. He was thrilled. You should, you should have seen the look on his face when they let him go. Jonas slowed the strokes of his hand on her back thoughtfully. Larissa, he asked, what happens when they make the actual release? Where exactly did Roberto go? She lifted her bare wet shoulders in a small shrug. I don't know. I don't think anybody does, except the committee. He just bowed to all of us and then walked, like they all do, through the special door in the releasing room. But you should have seen his look. Pure happiness, I'd call it. Jonas grinned. I wish I'd been there to see it. Marissa frowned. I don't know why they don't let the children come. Not enough room, I guess. They should enlarge the releasing room. We'll have to suggest it then, uh, to that committee, to the committee. Maybe they'd study it, Jonas said slyly. And Marissa chortled with laughter. Right, she hooted. Jonas helped her from the top. Chapter 5 Usually, at the morning ritual, when the family members told their dreams, Jonas didn't contribute, mon con contribute much. He rarely dreamed. Sometimes he awoke with a feeling of fragments of float in his sleep, but he couldn't seem to grasp them and put them together into something worthy of telling at the ritual. But this morning was different. He had dreamed very vividly the night before. His mind wandered while Lily, as usual, recounted a lengthy dream. This one, a frightening one, in which she had, against the rules, been riding her brother's bicycle and been caught by the security guards. They all listened carefully and discussed with Lily the warning that the dream had given. Thank you for your dream, Lily, Jonas said with a standard phrase automatically. It tried to pay better attention while his mother told him a dream fragment, a disquieting scene where she had been chastised for a rule and fraction she didn't understand. 
got it, but it wasn't really the same. There was a tub in the dream, but only one. And the real bathing room had rows and rows of them. But the dream, excuse me, but the room in the dream was warm and damp. And I had taken off my tunic, but hadn't put on the smock, so my chest was bare. I was perspiring because it was so warm, and Fiona was there, and the way she was yesterday. Asher, too? Mother asked. Jonas shook his head. No, it was only me and Fiona alone in the room, standing beside the tub. She was laughing, but I wasn't. I was almost a little angry at her in the dream because she wasn't taking me seriously. Seriously about what? Well, he asked. Jonas looked at his plate. For some reason that I didn't understand, he felt slightly embarrassed. I, I think I was trying to convince her that she should get into the tub of water. He paused. He knew he had to tell it all. That it was not only all right, but necessary to tell all of a dream. So he forced himself to relate the part that made him uneasy. I wanted her to take off her clothes and get into the tub, he explained quickly, but I wanted to bathe her. I had the sponge in my hand, but she wouldn't. She kept laughing and saying no. He looked up at his parents. That's all, he said. Can you describe the strongest feeling in your dream, son? The father asked. Jonas thought about it. The details were murky and vague, but the feelings were clear and flooded him again now as he thought. The, the wanting, he said. I knew that she wouldn't, and I think I knew that she shouldn't, but I wanted it so terribly I could feel the wanting all through me. Thank you for your dream, Jonas, his mother said after a moment. She glanced at Father. Lily, Father said, it's time to leave for school. Would you walk beside me this morning and keep an eye on the new child's basket? We want to be certain he doesn't wiggle himself loose. Jonas began to rise to collect his school books. He thought it surprising that they hadn't talked about his dream at length before the thank you. Perhaps they found it confusing as he had, as, he, as confusing as he had. Wait, Jonas, mother said gently. I'll write an apology to your instructor so that you won't have to speak one for being late. He sank back down into his chair, puzzled. He, he waved to father and Lily as they left the dwelling, carrying Gabe in his basket. He watched while mother tidied the remains of the morning meal and placed the tray by the front door for the collection crew. Finally, she sat down beside him at the table. Jonas, she said with a smile, the feeling you described as the wanting, it was your first stirrings. Father and I have been expecting it to happen to you. It happens to everyone. It happened to Father when he was your age, and it happened to me. It will happen someday, someday to Lily. And very often, Father added, it begins with a dream. Stirrings. He had heard the word before. He remembered that there was a reference to the stirrings in the Book of Rules, though he didn't remember what it said. And now and then, the speaker, the speaker mentioned it. Attention. Reminder that stirrings must be reported in order for treatment to take place. He had always ignored that announcement because he didn't understand it. It never seemed to apply to him in any way. He ignored it, as most citizens did. Many of the commands and reminders read by the speaker. Do I have to report it? He asked his mother. She laughed. You did, in the dream telling. That's enough. But what about the treatment? The speaker says that the treatment must, pay, must take place. Jonas felt miserable. Just when the ceremony was about to happen, his ceremony of twelve, would he have to go away someplace for treatment just because of a stupid dream? But his mother laughed again in a reassuring, affectionate way. No, no, she said. It's just the pills. You're ready for the pills. That's all. That's the treatment for stirrings. Jonas Bright, he knew about the pills. His parents both took them each morning. And some of his friends did, he knew. Once he had been heading off to school with Asher both of them on, on their bikes when Asher's father had called them had called from their dwelling doorway. You forgot your pill, Asher! Asher had groaned good-naturedly, turned his bike, and ridden back while Jonas waited. It was the sort of thing one didn't ask a friend about, because it might have fallen into that uncomfortable category of being different. Asher took a pill each morning. Jonas did not. Always better, less rude, to talk about things that were the same. Now, he swallowed the small pill that his mother handed him. That's all? he asked. That's all, she replied returning the bottle to the cupboard. You, but you mustn't forget it. I'll remind you for the first weeks, but then you must do it on your own. If you forget, the stirrings will come back. The dreams of stirrings will come back. Sometimes the dosage must be adjusted. Asher takes them, Jonas confided. His mother nodded, unsurprised. Many of your crewmates probably do. The males, at least. And they all will soon. Females, too. How long until... Excuse me, how long will I have to take them? Until you enter the house of the old, she explained all of your adult life, but it becomes routine. After a while, you won't even pay much attention to it. She looked 
at her watch. If you leave right now, you won't even be late for school. Hurry along. Uh, thank you again, Jonas, she added, as she went to the door, for your dream. Pedaling rapidly down the path, Jonas felt oddly proud to have joined those who took the pills. For a moment, though, he remembered the dream again. The dream had felt pleasurable, though the feelings were confused. He thought that he had liked the feelings that his mother called stirrings. He remembered that upon waking, he'd wanted to feel the stirrings again. Then, in the same way that his own dwelling slipped away behind him as he rounded a corner on his bicycle, the dream slipped away from his thoughts. Very briefly, a little guiltily, he tried to grasp it back, but the feelings had disappeared. The stirrings were gone. Chapter 6 Lily, please hold still, Mother said again. Lily, standing in front of her, fidgeted impatiently. I can tie them myself, she complained. I always have. I know that, Mother replied, straightening the hair ribbons on the little girl's braids, but I also know that they constantly came, come loose, and more often than not, they're dangling down your back by afternoon. Today, at least, we want them to be neatly tied and snitted to stay neatly tied. I don't like hair ribbons. I'm glad I only have to wear them one more year, Lily said irritably. Next year, I get my bicycle, too, she added more cheerfully. There are good things each year, Jonas reminded her. This year you get to start your volunteer hours, and remember last year when you became a seven, you were so happy to get your front button jacket? The little girl nodded and looked down at herself, at the jacket with its row of large buttons that designated her as a seven. Fours, fives, and sixes all wore jackets that fastened down the back so that they would have to help each other dress and would learn interdependence. The front button jacket was the first sign of independence, the, very, the first very visible symbol of growing up. The bicycle at nine would be the powerful emblem moving gradually out into the community, away from the protective family unit. Lily grinned and wriggled away from her mother. And this year, you get your assignment, she said to Jonas in an excited voice. I hope you get pilot, and that you take me flying. Sure I will, said Jonas. And I'll, do, and I'll get a special little parachute that just fits you. And I'll take you up to, oh, maybe 20,000 feet, and open the door, and... Jonas, mother warned. I was only joking. Jonas broke. I don't, want to, I don't want pilot anyway. If I get pilot, I'll put it in appeal. Come on, mother said. She gave Lily's ribbons a final tug. Jonas, are you ready? Did you take your pill? I want to get a good seat at the Hindu auditorium. She prodded Lily into the front door, and Jonas followed. It was a short ride to the auditorium. Lily waving to her friends from her seat on the back of her of mother's bicycle. Jonas stowed his bicycle beside mother's and made his way through the throng to find his room. The entire community attended the ceremony each year. For, for the parents, it meant two, ho two, day, two days holiday from, from work. They sat together in the huge hall. Children sat with their groups until they went one by one to the stage. The father, though, would not join mother in the, auditor in the audience right away. For the earliest ceremony, the naming, the nurturers brought the new children to the stage. Jonas, from his place in the balcony with the elevens, searched the auditorium for a glimpse of father. It wasn't at all hard to spot the nurturer's section at the front. Coming from it were the wails and howls of the, of the new children who sat squirming on the nurturer's laps. At every other public ceremony, the audience was silent and attentive, but once a year, they all smiled indulgently at the commotion from the little ones waiting to receive their names and families. Jonas finally caught his father's eye and waved. Father grinned and waved back, then held up the hand of the new child on his lap, making him wave too. It wasn't Gabriel. Gabe was back at the nurturing center today, being cared for by the night crew. He had been given an unusual and special reprieve from the committee and granted an additional year of nurturing before his naming and placement. Father had gone before the committee with a plea on behalf of Gabriel, who had not yet gained the weight appropriate to his days of life, nor begun to sleep soundly enough at night to be placed with his family unit. Normally, such a new child would be labeled inadequate and released from the community. Instead, as a result of, the, of Father's plea, Gabriel had been labeled uncertain and given an additional year. He would continue to be nurtured at the center and would spend his nights on with Jonas's family unit. Each family member, including Lily, had been required to sign a pledge that they would not become attached to this little temporary guest and that they would relinquish him without protest or appeal when he was assigned to his own family unit at next year's ceremony. At least, Jonas thought, after Gabriel was placed next year, they would still see him often because he would be part of the community. If he were released, they would not see him again, ever. Those who were released, even as new children, 
were sent elsewhere and never returned to the community. Father had not had to release a single new child this year, so Gabriel would have represented a real failure and sadness. Even Jonas, though he didn't hover over the little one the way Lily and his father did, was glad that Gabe had not been released. The first ceremony began right on time, and Jonas watched as one after another each new child was given a name and handed by the nurturers to its new family unit. For some, it was a first child, but many came to the stage accompanied by another child beaming with pride to receive a little brother or sister the way Jonas had when he was about to be a five. Asher poked Jonas's arm. Remember when we got Philippa? He asked in a loud whisper. Jonas nodded. It had only been last year. Asher's parents had waited quite a long time before applying for a second child. Maybe, Jonas suspected, they had been so exhausted by Asher's lively foolishness that they had needed a little time. Two of their group, Fiona and another female named Thea, were missing temporarily, waiting with their parents to receive new children. But it was rare that, a, that there was such an age gap between children in a family unit. When her family's ceremony was completed, Fiona took the seat that had been saved for her in the row ahead of Asher and Jonas. She turned and whispered to them, He's cute, but I don't like his name very much. She made a face and giggled. Fiona's new brother had been named Bruno. It wasn't a great name, Jonas thought, like, well, Gabriel, for example, but it was okay. The audience applause, which was enthusiastic at each naming, rose in an exuberant swell when one parental heir, glowing with pride, took a male new child and heard him named Caleb. This new Caleb was a, was a replacement child. The couple had lost their first Caleb, a cheerful little four. Loss of a child was very, very rare. The community was extraordinarily safe, each citizen watchful and protective of all children, but somehow the first little Caleb wandered away unnoticed and had fallen into the river. The entire community had performed the ceremony of loss together, murmuring the name Caleb throughout an entire day, less and less frequently, softer in volume, as the long and somber day went on, so that the little four seemed to fade away gradually from everyone's consciousness. Now at this special naming, the community performed the brief murmur of replacement ceremony, repeating the name for the first time since the loss, softly and slowly at first, then faster with greater volume, as the couple stood on the stage with the new child sleeping in the mother's arms. It was as if the first Caleb were returning. Another new child was given the name Roberto, and Jonas remembered that Roberto the Old had been released only last week, but there was no murmur of replacement ceremony for the new little Roberto. Release was not the same as loss. He sat politely through the ceremonies of two and three and four, increasingly bored as he was each year, but then a break for midnight meal, served after the bed, back again to the seats for the five, six, and sevens, and finally, last of the first day ceremonies, the eights. Jonas watched and cheered as Lily marched proudly to the stage, became an eight, and received the identifying jacket that she would wear this year. This one with smaller buttons and, for the first time, pockets, indicating that she was mature enough now to keep track of her own small belongings. She stood solemnly listening to the speech of firm instructions on the responsibilities of eight and doing volunteer hours for the first time. But Jonas could see that Lily, though she seemed attentive, was looking longingly at the row of gleaming bicycles, which would be presented tomorrow morning to the nines. Next year, Lily Billy, Jonas thought. It was an exhausting day, and even Gabriel, retrieved in his basket from the nursery center, slept soundly that night. Finally, 